Thanks for joining us. Legends and Losers is sponsored by NetSuite from Oracle. Learn to turbocharge your growth today at netsuite.com slash legends. This is a very big podcast episode. Um, it's a big conversation for big people with the amazing Dr. Shoshana Hungerleiter. We're going to talk about how to have a legendary death. That's right, a legendary death. Um, now, before you think this topic is too heavy and maybe not something you want to listen to, it, it might not be for you, but I would, I would encourage you to stick with us. Um, uh, Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter is uh, not a heavy person. She's a super engaging, super easy to be around, incredibly effective, uh, obviously incredibly smart, and an incredibly accomplished person. And the truth is, if we want to have a legendary life, having a legendary death is part of it and so how do we design that part um, Dr. Shoshana is a filmmaker um, so the San Francisco Business Times says she's one of the 40 under 40 to watch she's an activist in palliative and hospice care and she's got a new Netflix documentary out called Endgame and she's the founder of a symposium called Endwell which deals with um, design and innovation for the, quote, end-of-life experience. This is a powerful topic. Uh, we engage in discussion about how to live well as long as possible and why Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter wants you to master your end game. All right, all right, all right. Hey-ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for this incredible, important um, episode of Legends and Losers. Um, people tell me that um, uh, they love the variety of Legends and Losers, that this podcast is like a box of chocolates and that we tackle things that uh, you rarely hear elsewhere and almost never hear in the mainstream business media. And uh, the truth is, if we're going to have an ongoing dialogue together about how to design a legendary business and a legendary life, part of life is dying. And so uh, we all need to think about how we're going to stick the landing. And I think we also need to think about how we're going to help other people, the people in our lives that we love uh, as they face end of life, as we all are going to. And so this is a powerful conversation. Um, it, it, it's an engaging one. I promise it's not too heavy. Uh, Dr. Shoshana is an awesome gal. Um, and I also recommend you check out her Netflix film, Endgame. Now, without any further ado, here she is, the amazing Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. And it turned out that my, my passion, sort of early on in training, um, I realized was issues related to serious illness, um, end of life, um, the fields of hospice and palliative care. So I've really been able to build um, my other work around uh, furthering those topics and those conversations. And when did you make a decision to get on this mission because because you feel like a person on a mission to uh change things and i, I you know want to get your perspective on that but everything i consume of you um you sound very much like a missionary <laughs> well um i will yes I, I would say i'm i'm definitely you know hyper focused in in this area you know it was early on in my residency so my first year um i spent many many months uh doing rotations uh in the icu as many people do and um i you know really was struck by a few things um i was very often taking care of, of people who were um, older age, you know, of elderly people who were very frail physically, who had many, many medical problems that they'd been dealing with for a long time. And then they ended up in the ICU where we provide the most aggressive invasive treatments um, for their end stage liver disease or end stage heart failure or their widely spread cancer. Um, and we would hook them up to, you know, lots of machines. They have tubes, they have lines coming out of their bodies. Um, sometimes they were awake, sometimes they weren't. 
Um, and, and I realized that nothing that we were going to do in that environment that we were so poised to you know, offer and, and provide for them was really going to uh, probably change the outcome of the fact that they were dying. Um, and it didn't totally make sense to me. You know, um, I think, you know, many of these medical cases are incredibly complex and to kind of wade through all of the data that that's provided, um, is is tricky. And, but, but I realized that nobody, you know, on the medical side was really looking at the big picture, um, in terms of what's going on, you know, with this patient in terms of sort of the context of, of their entire life? Um, do they have a sense of sort of what's happening? Um, maybe, maybe talking about their prognosis or have an understanding of what the next, you know, days or weeks might look like given that they're so sick. And, you know, the answer. Sometimes, uh, sometimes as a patient or as uh, somebody who loves a patient in mm-hmm. these kinds of situations, and I don't mean to sound shitty, but they're, it can feel like the person's not even there the way the medical staff talk. Right. Do you know what I, do you know what I, is that what you're describing? Let's see. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that, that's right. Um, I think it's, uh, well, I'll say a few things. I think we do a terrible job in medicine of sitting down, of taking the extra time to talk with patients, to talk with, you know, the, their family and loved ones about what's going on. Um, a, a recent study came out actually in, in 2016 in the journal, the American Medical Association, we call that JAMA. Um, and they had surveyed lots and lots of doctors and 70% of those doctors surveyed said that they hadn't been trained in how to have difficult conversations with patients, which completely blows my mind because the majority of what I do as a hospital-based doctor is have difficult conversations, whether it's about, you know, goals of care or, gosh, you're, you're not getting better right now. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? What's your understanding of the current, you know, state of your illness? Um, what does, you know, the rest of your life, um, for you, uh, hopefully look like, uh, knowing that. And, um, so absolutely. I mean, we, we do a terrible job of engaging patients and, and, and their families, especially in, sort of those uh, acute crisis times of, of being gravely ill. Um, and so... And it's disconcerting for us. Yeah. You know, I remember years ago, my um, grandmother was towards the... turned out towards the end of her life, and um, she needed to have hip surgery. And um, we couldn't get a hold of the surgeon who was going to do the surgery. And so we, we hadn't hadn't even been able to talk to him. We didn't really know what was going on or what he was really going to do other than some high level stuff. Anyway, so I sort of forced myself, you know, onto him uh, at the nursing station and and my uncle was standing next to me. And of course this was his mother. And, and so I started asking the surgeon some questions and he's, it's like, it's like trying to, I feel like a cop interrogating a, (laughs) you know, somebody who doesn't want to tell me an informant who doesn't want to inform. Anyway, so I finally get him to talk and explain a little bit about this surgery. And he looks like he sort of had gotten to the end. And then I said to him, and doctor, is there anything else we should know? And he looks at me and he says, yes, there's a 70% chance she'll die during the operation. And first of all, it was like somebody who punched my uncle in the chest. Um, and then I just looked at him and I thought, well, it's a damn good thing I asked the question then, isn't it? <laughs> and mm-hmm. so that, you know, led to some more questions. But I guess I, I share that with you because afterwards, I just couldn't quite comprehend, you know, the, the bedside manner or lack thereof of this physician. Um, and that's a stunning thing when, when you're in the kind of, when that, that kind of situation. And so I guess this leads me to a question, which is, why have you made this such an important part of what you do? Well, you know, after seeing that happen so many times as somebody who, you know, has, has given my life to uh, taking care of people, of, of healing people, um, I think patients and families deserve better. We have to do a better job at communicating, of talking about, you know, what, what's going to work for a patient based on their illness and the stage of life that they're in. 
Um, there's no reason that you should have had to interrogate the surgeon to find out that information. That's critically important. If, if it was in fact a 70% mortality, potential mortality rate, like why is she having the surgery? Right. Um, so, so digging deeper into those kinds of questions, I think that, you know, all patients, all families should feel empowered, um, to, to ask those. I mean, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we actually have a, have a hidden public health crisis in this country in that. Have you um, said that it's the biggest health crisis in this country? Absolutely not. I would not say it's the biggest. There's so many, uh, things happening that are, um, you know, in, in, incredibly, um, challenging and, uh, you know, problematic. So not, not the biggest, but I would say it's, it's one that I know the most about and, and I'm really focused on making a difference. So why do we get dying so wrong in our culture? Doctor? <laughs> Gosh, uh, how much time do you have? Uh, I think, as much time as you have. <laughs> <laughs> I think so many reasons I would say on the medical side, you know, we're taught that, um, death is a treatment failure. Right, we should do everything in our power to avoid failure um, as doctors. That you know, we that we don't have a place um, in caring and in healing when when cure is no longer possible. I think that's that's what's taught traditionally in medicine. Now that's changing slowly over time, and I would say now we're doing a much better job than we did even ten or and for sure twenty years ago in teaching um, physicians. But um, you know, partly. It's, it's sort of the, the culture of medicine. Um, I would say that, you know, on the sort of society at large um, angle that, you know, we have a real aversion and maybe rightly so um, to, to talking about death and dying, to, to accepting mortality. I think that we're sort of genetically wired, right? To, to li- you know, to live for as long as possible and that, um, and that makes sense. But I also think that, you know, death is a part of life, whether we're going to talk about it or not, whether we're going to accept it or not. And so, you know, to me, the, the more that we can engage in some kind of conversation about our shared mortality, um, you know, uh, the better. And, and as a physician, I can say that the more that, that people um, talk to the people that they love about what matters most to them, um, the more likely it is that they'll get care that's in line with their goals and their values of how they've lived their lives. And that's what's the most important thing to me. Now, it's not for sure that just because you have a um, you know, lengthy conversation with your family um, about your advanced directive and your wishes and your um, assign a healthcare proxy, it's not a slam dunk that you'll get exactly what you want because sometimes these situations are highly, they're highly nuanced and um, sometimes things break down and, and communication doesn't happen at the right time. And, um, but I think that the, that the, um, the way to, um, at least get you to a place where you're, um, being heard, um, by your healthcare professionals, where your family is hopefully on the same page about what you might want. Um, I think that, you know, starts with a conversation. And one you think most people don't have. Well, one that we know most people don't have, and they definitely don't, you know, for the most part, put it down in writing and and talk to their doctors about it. Um, it's it's a it's a tough conversation and one that is constantly put off because there isn't usually a sense of urgency. And then when an acute crisis happens, we know it's nearly impossible to make a thoughtful decision about what you might want because it's it's there's so much going on in that in that moment so those of us who and this may sound like a funny thing to say but those of us who want to design let me say it let me say it in a more fun way Uh, those of us who want to stick the landing in our own particular way (laughs) (laughs) um we can write this shit in our will can't we shoshana I mean, we can make, we can have a legal document that says, this is what I want. You can, absolutely. And I would highly encourage it. I think more important than a legal document is actually conversations. So we know uh, the data support that uh, sometimes up to half of the time, advanced directives aren't followed. 
in an acute crisis moment, such so if you no were to... going to go dig out the will of well, Uncle Freddie? That's right. If you can't find it, um, if it's locked away in some, you know, cabinet or even if, you know, you know, your aunt has it, but she's not there to, to provide it. You know, we have a default way by which, you know, patients are cared for. So I think that's an important overarching thing for people to know that if, you know, um, that no matter, you know, how old you are, no matter how sick you are, you will receive aggressive, invasive care by default. And actually, even if it won't even help you, that's sort of what we do in this country. Um, and so if you don't want that at any point in time, you have to make sure that the people around you know that. And especially if you aren't able to speak for yourself, that's why assigning what we call a healthcare proxy or a durable power of attorney is really, really important. And make sure that that person is someone that knows you well, hopefully lives nearby you so that they can, they're around if something is to happen. Um, and am I, I don't know the legalities of it. Am I legally allowed? I mean, I'm legally allowed to deny uh, care, right? Or to, 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 to n- not be cared for. Yes. For yourself? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're awake and you're saying, Hey, listen, like, I don't want that tube or I don't want that antibiotic or let's talk about, you know, what, what's happening here and, and figure out what makes sense for me. Absolutely. Um, uh, I can, can deny myself care at any time. Can I not? Absolutely. And so the, the, I guess the problem becomes in a critical situation where you can't speak for yourself. Um, how do you make sure that your wishes are upheld as opposed to the position that the uh, medical community is going to take, which is aggressive care no matter what? Absolutely. That's right. And, and, and that's not to say that, you know, I, I'm not somebody that's against Western medicine. I obviously like, you know, practice in a hospital setting. I take care of ICU patients. We save lives every day in the ICU. We have amazingly, you know, modern, wonderful technology. Um, it's just that I don't think that everybody needs to be on that same trajectory and especially not if it's not something that they want or that they, or they don't understand so what I, what I really want is for conversations to, to take place such that people are empowered with information, with uh, n- maybe knowing a little bit about their prognosis so that they can make a thoughtful decision about what works for them. And if, and if, and if it is, in fact, you know, uh, days or weeks or months or even years to live in the setting of a serious illness, that they can live that time in a way that, you know, works for them. They can focus on sort of quality of life um, if that's what they want. So, and that's where sort of the world of palliative care as a field of medicine comes in. And I just am such a big fan of, uh, of the work that, that palliative care brings. So if this may sound like a crazy question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, if you were going to coach me how to design a legendary exit, you know, if you say, if you say part of having a legendary life is you also got to design your exit. You got to design your death. And so what advice, what coaching would you give me um, on how I should design uh, a legendary death? Wow. Well, I think I would first start by saying that there is not, there isn't one right way to do this, right? What, what works for you may not work for me or work for, you know, my father, So I just want to preface this all by saying that there isn't one sort of best way to die. Um, To me, it's about making sure that um, you live your life um, for as well as possible for as long as possible. And now I think that, you know, as a young, younger person who's relatively healthy, so myself, you know, I have, I have thoughts right now about what, you know, the end of life should look like for me. I know full well, and my experience as a physician, you know, has shown me that that changes over time. So at 38, what I think I want based on what I know, and when I'm 58, and maybe when I'm 78, are probably going to look different. Um, So I guess my first bit of advice would be, you know, to say that, you know, having a conversation and thinking about this now in whatever stage you're in makes good sense, but know that you need to revisit that conversation as life goes on, as your personal circumstances and your health 
nature of changes over time as it will. Um, and, uh, I think that there are some wonderful tools out there, um, to help people have conversations, uh, with the people that they love. I mean, sometimes this can be a, a tricky conversation. So, um, there's, there's actually a really cool card game. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's called go wish. And it's a deck of cards that you can pull out and play with even young people and, and really hits on a number of issues that, um, are related to, you know, what you might want if, if you're to become, you know, very sick, um, or unable to speak for yourself so that the people that you love can get to know you better as a human being. Um, these aren't, you know, typically conversations that we have around the dinner table, although we probably should be. Um, so, you know, to me, it starts there. It starts with an internal kind of reflection on this and then a conversation with the people you love. And then when you can get it down in writing, so creating some kind of document about your wishes and assigning and writing down, you know, who your healthcare proxy or otherwise known as your durable power of attorney is, I think those, you know, three things are, are really critical, but again, they need to be revisited you know, every five years, every 10 years, or maybe even more frequently if, if your circumstances change. Um, and, I, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the advice um, I would give. So start by talking about it and try to really unpack it and then ultimately get, get it written down and, and talk about it and change it as required. Yeah. And so... Um, I feel very fortunate in my life, Shoshana, because uh, as a teenager, my dad taught me how to complete with uh, someone who was dying at the time. It was my grandfather. Um, and and he made it clear to me what was going on because I didn't, you know, when you're 16, you don't have radar for that. Um, and he, he was explicit. He said, listen, if there's anything you want to hear from your grandfather, you should hear it now. Jeez, I'm going to get teary. If there's anything you want to say, you should say it now. And so I did that, and I spent time with him um, towards the end of his life. And so ever since then, I've tried to be very present, very clear, very direct when faced with um, the death of someone I love. Mm. Um, and I hate to say this. But I'm now good at it. I don't fuck around. The minute this is, this is up, I don't fuck around. I get right to it. Mm. But I, do, I, I, I also know that it seems like, just based on my own personal experience, more people can't or won't do that than can. I've been amazed uh, seeing how, how people just sort of disappear as, as a loved one is dying and because they, quote unquote, can't take it. And they sort of... Mm miss mo must much of the end of you know either a parent or a spouse or i mean somebody they you know a very close friend whatever it is i've seen it happen many times and so it appears that many of us have a really hard time uh with talking about it and then ultimately dealing with this as it's going on um, mm -hmm. this may be a stupid question but is that is that the case I think so. I mean, your dad, your dad did, it was your dad that did such, such a service yes. um, to you by, by inviting you in, you know, to, as a teenager to be there. Um, when, when your grandfather was dying, a lot of people think that they need to shelter their children from the end of life. And I, you know, I would say that, gosh, maybe, maybe think twice about that because, you know, uh, I think the more that, um, you know, our, our mortality can be shared in terms of, of, of experiencing sort of a natural part of the human experience, um, the better. And the more, like, like you're saying, you can be present for people um, who are in that stage of life and, and recognize that it's really a privilege to be there when somebody's um, near the end and then, and then dying, passing on. Um, I think that's right. I think, you know, for a lot of people, this is something that's been hidden away in their lives. That's, that's very, very common. And it is really hard. There's, there's no denying it. It's absolutely a, a tough thing. Um, and I don't think we'll ever get to a place as much as I would love it that, that everybody, you know, is, is comfortable with this conversation. 
Um, we don't always know what people's you know experiences have been maybe trauma around around illness and end of life. So there's no way we can know sort of wh- where people are coming from in terms of not wanting to, to be there um, or, it be, or it being too much. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, you're, you're somebody who clearly has um, been, been a witness and, and sat with um, people in this most intimate time. And so, yeah, I'm getting mussed up myself, but, and so we as a culture don't talk about this. How, how do we train ourselves, those of us who want to get better at this, um, in, in, um, supporting somebody that we love through the end of life? Well, I I think um, it starts with just showing up, you know, saying I'm I'm here, you know, what, what, what can I do? Um, And again, knowing that, you know, there isn't one right way to do that. There isn't one right situation or right thing to say. Um, But I think just uh, connecting with people at a time when they, you know, uh, feel probably very isolated and alone for the most part Um, and just saying, you know, I'm here. Um, I think is, is really powerful. And I think the more that, that we can have conversations like this, um, we can talk about it with our families, with our friends, with people that we love, um, the, the closer we will be to a place where, you know, there's, there's more of a collective acceptance of the fact that part of being human is also, uh, is living and dying. And, uh, I've, I've always had this thought about dying that's and I know this is a theme that's been around since the creation of the the, the human race I've got to imagine that um, you know death is this thing that we all fear um, that we certainly none of us uh, are interested in participating in um, at any time soon no, no nobody wants to <laughs> die soon uh, we all want more time and and yet of course if we lived forever that would change everything. And, and there's something about the fact that we don't have a lot of time that uh, provides a tremendous amount of meaning to us in our lives. And to the best of our knowledge, you tell me if, if you know better, but we're the only creature on the planet that actually knows we're going to die. And so um, dying in a lot of ways creates a lot of powerful meaning and, mm-hmm. and therefore um, the value that we place on being alive because we know we have a limited amount of time. And so there's this weird dichotomy about this where on one hand, you know, none of us want to die anytime soon. We'd like to live, if not forever, for a very long time. But at the same time, we all sort of understand that we're going to, whether we want to or not. And in some ways, the fact that there's an expiry date um, <laughs> is at least part of what gives us value and meaning. How do you think about these things, Doctor? Gosh, I couldn't even, I couldn't have said that better myself. I mean, absolutely. I think I can say that, you know, for, for me and other people that I know who work in this space or who have sat by the bedside, as you have, um, of someone who's dying, know that something sacred is happening at the end of life. Um, that, you know, there's a window opening, um, to what it is that binds us together as, as human beings, a part of this huge, you know, uh, wondrous whole of people. And I know that for me, being reminded of mortality makes my own life uh, much sweeter, um, richer, you know, uh, more uh, recognize that, you know, it really is a miracle to be alive. Um, so that, that's what I'll say to that. And I got to ask you on the personal side, um, I mean, there, there are people who have quote unquote high stress jobs. Um, your job is, is, I, I don't want to put in any words in your mouth, but it has to tug on your heartstrings all the time. And so maybe tell me about your job and what it's like to have this, you know, to have chosen this. Yeah. So, you know, I take care of all kinds of patients. So it's not just people who are seriously ill or maybe nearing the end of life. I take care of a wide range. So that keeps things 
kind of um, uh, uh, slightly less um, stressful for me. I'm, I'm not somebody who just does hospice or just does palliative care, although that's a lot of the focus of my non-clinical work. Um, but absolutely, I think, you know, the seeing, you know, witnessing suffering um, over and over um, does take a toll on, uh, on healthcare providers. We know that both in nursing and in medicine, the rates of professional burnout, um, of suicide, of, of depression, of course, of, of substance abuse are astronomically higher than other uh, well, they're astronomically high and, and much higher than other professions. And I think part of that is that we really experience some trauma in the witnessing of suffering. And we don't have an outlet or a platform to really talk about that. You know, part of the, the culture, and I'll speak for medicine, um, is about kind of just stuffing your feelings inside. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, I've, I've been at many, many situations that we call like a code blue or somebody is having a, a cardiac arrest, say, um, in the hospital. And we, you know, spend 45 minutes, you know, with, with many, many doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists, all trying our very hardest to revive somebody doing CPR, you know, putting in all kinds of IV lines and, um, and intubating them. And sometimes people don't make it. Um, and after 45 minutes of this high stress, you know, high intensity situation, if the person dies, we just stop and we take off our masks and our gowns and our gloves, throw them in the garbage and move on to the next. And nobody stops and says, my goodness, like we've just witnessed something, you know, incredibly traumatic. Uh, for sure for the patient, but also for us. So there's no built in place to debrief these kinds of situations. And I think um, that's, that's part of the reason. Um, one factor why, you know, burnout in medicine is so, um, is so high because when people, you know, if you are sort of emotionally uh, distressed by that, as most people are, you know, they, they just don't have a place um, to kind of let that out. Um, and I think as a result, many, many doctors um, build up kind of walls, emotional walls between themselves and their patients. And I think some degree of a barrier is important. I mean, you can't be emotionally wrapped up in every single patient that you see or else absolutely people would not be able to do their jobs day in and day out. But um, there has to be a balance there and I think we're, we have not done a good job in medicine of, of teaching people how to find that um, and how to work with it so that they can have long, sustaining careers of taking care of people. Yeah. And so how, how do you deal with it yourself? Gosh, well, I, you know, for me, I, part of it is that I don't do clinical medicine 24-7. So I, I work part-time and do non-clinical work, which I find incredibly meaningful and fulfilling the other part of the time. Um, but I think, um, you know, talking with colleagues about how I'm doing or how I'm feeling, especially after a, a difficult or traumatic experience with a patient, you know, has been hugely helpful for me. I mean, there, there are programs that are just now starting to, to be built out in, in healthcare systems to help support, you know, healthcare cl clinicians to, sort of talk about their feelings, which as, you know, basic as that sounds, we're just, we haven't really been doing that until very recently. So I, I think it's incredibly important. And when I'm working with the residents at the hospital where I work, you know, I think I, I try to um, convey that, you know, that's critical. And especially if, if somebody is having a hard time to, to reach out for help, um, it's always, um, always okay to say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here. Let's, let's talk about it. And do you see doctors doing more of that to, to deal with some of these uh, uh, highly emotional situations that you folks find yourselves in on a pretty regular basis? You know, um, it's not as, you know, as widely done as I would like, but I think we're getting there. I think the recognition by the American Medical Association, by really everyone that, that professional burnout is a huge issue in medicine. Um, 
you know, this is obviously something we should be doing anyway, regardless of that. But um, I think that's sort of been the motivation to kind of build programs related to physician wellness um, and to just kind of prevent burnout. You also, and obviously we don't know each other super well, but you seem like somebody who's living a very big life, that there are, there are other parts of your life that are big and important to you, not just being a physician, although I don't mean to say just in that way, you know, <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean? You, you seem like a very big person, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. Well, I, uh, I think, I think I do. I mean, I, I think that medicine has really informed my view of the world and the things that I care about. So I would say, you know, first and foremost, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor. Um, and I, you know, went into medicine to be in service of other people. I think, um, for reasons that I will never fully understand, you know, I've found myself doing many, many things that aren't related to, to my doctoring, to taking care of people, Um, because I really, you know, want to see change happen. I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, recognized, um, in my first year of training that, gosh, we have these huge, um, gaps in the way that doctors are trained in the ways that these conversations aren't taking place for seriously ill people. So what, you know, what can I do, um, uh, to try to change that? And so, I think, you know, for me, it's been really important to think about this as a, as a public health crisis, as something that we as human beings, as, you know, as a culture can really tackle. So I've, I've really focused a lot of my energy and attention outside the hospital on, you know, what, what are the ways that, that we can do that, whether it's through leveraging social media, whether it's through creating a symposium around end of life, whether it's, you know, supporting documentary film to help foster these conversations. So um, I, I think I've, I've gotten lucky in that some of these opportunities have really fallen in my lap. Well, uh, you've also taken a pretty uh, significant stand, right? Uh, it's very clear that who you are is somebody who's standing up on this topic. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there, there, look, I'm not an expert in this field, but there are not a lot of doctors who are out in front on this topic the way you are. Well, you know, I, I guess I would say that there are many, many, uh, you know, healthcare professionals and, and, and lay people who have cared about this issue for a long, long, long time and are doing amazing work. And they've been doing it for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So I'm not going to say that I'm the first person to come out and say, listen, guys, we have a problem here. Um, I think maybe it just so happens that I, you know, I'm doing more things in a public way related to this topic. Um, and I'm trying to shine light, you know, on some of this amazing work that's happened over the past many years to get us where we are today. Um, so I, well, and you are, you're, you're savvy about the new shit, <laughs> if I can put it that way. <laughs> right, I mean, right. You, 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 uh, you, you know how to give a great talk and your talks get viewed, you know, I don't know, I, I haven't looked recently, but I mean, you know, you have a, a couple of really popular talks your your physic you know you're out there in the world you're leveraging um whether it's podcasting or youtubing or uh, you know new forms of media old forms of media you're making yourself it, it's hard to deny that you're on this topic <laughs> right you're that's using, right you're using all of the modern tools to uh stoke a dialogue to spark a dialogue about how we really want to end our lives as individuals and how we as a society want to look at this uh crisis because it's it's something that's miserable for the, I, I, I mean, I got to believe this is a shitty way to die. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, I, an ex- I think so. <laughs> well, cause like I, I kind of want to die with the people around me that I love, hopefully, you know, having a glass of scotch and saying goodbye. Right. I, I certainly don't want to die with a bunch of tubes and, you know, shit shoved up my hoo-ha or whatever. Right. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to die that way. Do they? You know, t- typically not. I think very few people would choose that uh, as an ending. That said, sometimes, you know, things happen in life and, and you can't always get what you want. And so I think that, that gets back to this. song title. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I think even the best laid, you know, plans, um, you know, life can get in the way um, because we don't always know what you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. But I, I, I absolutely think that the more that people can 
again, talk about what they want, what matters most to them and bring the people they love into that conversation, the more likely it is that they're going to end up, you know, at home with drinking scotch, you know, and that's not to say that everybody wants to be at home or everyone should be at home. Sometimes that's not possible for people. Um, And sometimes people do choose the hospital. That's where they're the most and they're getting, you know, good care and that, that's what they want. And that's okay because we obviously can, can provide that. And, and look, this may be a tough topic and by all means, um, you know, kick me under the table. The, the topic is euthanasia and I'm very curious mm-hmm. how you think about it. I don't know what the exact law is in Canada, but um, having been through this in Canada more times than in the United States, it appears that medical institutions, doctors in Canada are more willing to nudge you out the door with maybe a little more morphine or whatever. I don't, you know, I'm no doc, but it seems like not that they're necessarily going to put you down, but you, there, there's a little, it, it, the, the gray area is a, feels a little wider. Let me say it that way in terms of how much you dial up the juice in Canada than in the United States, but I don't know, have any facts about that. So I'm just curious, how, how do you think about this? You know, the very last note, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I know nothing about Canada. So I, I apologize. I have never practiced in Canada, nor do I know sort of legally what's allowed and not allowed. And I didn't even realize you were Canadian until I just heard that little accent. <laughs> um, <Bonnie. laughs> yeah. Um, I, I can speak for, you know, myself and for what, what's happening in the state of California. Um, so, you know, the end of life option act, um, to allow what, what we call here, physician assisted death, um, to happen legally was passed, um, not very long ago. There's been some back and forth very recently, um, but it's back. How long, well, how long ago was it, Sheila? Gosh, I want to say it was uh, 2016. Yeah, it was so the last election cycle, right? It was. Because um, I can remember voting for it and sort of feeling some pride um, that, that it had happened in California. But I'm a layperson. What do you think about it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's actually a pretty tricky question. You know, I'm, I'm all about people having options. So, you know, what I want for myself um, and, and what I want for society at large, um, is, is options to have an end of life experience that is in line with their goals and their values. That said, you know, I think it's really important to recognize that, um, hospice and the whole realm, the whole field of, of palliative care, which is, you know, a, a, a whole arm of medicine that's focused on quality of life for anyone facing a serious illness um, that can be used alongside curative treatment if, if needed. So it's not just for the end of life. That isn't widely accessible yet to every person. Um, so, so my feeling is I would like to see in California, uh, around the United States, and frankly, around the world, that, that we um, make sure that, that palliative care, so an extra layer of support is provided to all people who are facing a life-limiting illness um, and, and allow you know, for, for that support to take place such that their physical symptoms, whether it's pain or difficulty breathing or psychosocial or you know, spiritual distress, existential suffering, um, are th- those needs are tended to. Um, and, I, and I think that um, the, the concern um, with legislation like the End of Life Option Act, you know, is that, gosh, do, do, how are we making sure that all of those people um, are, are referred and are offered care um, that supports them? Um, so I think, and especially people who are underserved or marginalized, um, the, the hope would be that they were, you know, um, receiving palliative care and and hospice care if that's what they wanted. So I'll just, I'll say that. Okay. And, and the new law, what does it allow you to do that you couldn't do before? Oh, well, I mean, I would say in the state of California, um, physician assisted death was not, was illegal. So meaning um, specifically, um, you know, a doctor was not allowed to prescribe a medication that could end your life. 
Um, now this is a little different in terms of maybe what you were asking about before when, you know, we, we use medicines like morphine, like other opiates or also known as narcotic medicines to treat pain symptoms for people who are, uh, seriously ill or near the end of life to treat symptoms like shortness of breath. It actually helps not only with pain, but also helps that the feeling of breathlessness and, and so one side effect um, of, of using those medicines is that um, sometimes, um, you know, death can be hastened in a way, but that's not the point of the why we use those medicines. I don't know if that makes sense or maybe yeah. this yeah. is a little too nuanced, you know, in terms of no, a conversation. I, that is I, very different than, than a doctor prescribing a medicine, handing it to a patient who's sick and saying, this medicine will kill you after you take it. Those are two very, very different things. So I, I guess so, that's so the distinction I would make. My perception, and look, I'm no lawyer and I'm no doctor, but is that in Canada, and again, I don't know what the law actually says, but in Canada, they can dial up the morphine and sort of um, nudge you out that last inch out the door, so to speak. Um, so, but the, just, just so we're clear, the intent, at least in the United States, and I would imagine also in Canada, of, of turning up the narcotic or the opiate, the morphine, is actually to treat symptoms, meaning to help somebody who is, you know, having trouble breathing near the end or in pain near the end. So that's the intent. If that happens to also hasten death, then that's a, that's a side effect. But so that's the distinction is that in medicine, we have to be very clear about the fact that, um, you know, in those settings, we're treating the current symptoms that the patient is having, um, which is a different thing than, you know, that the whole conversation we just had about, about prescribing a medicine to allow someone to die. Correct. So so today in California, uh, you can prescribe a medicine. You can describe, you can prescribe me uh, medicine. That's going to kill me legally. If you are diagnosed with a life limiting illness and you have, you know, uh, capacity to make, you know, sound medical decisions for yourself and yeah, so there, there's a whole would, bunch of things i wasn't suggesting yes. i would call you after a bad day and say hey shoshana can you just um can you call cvs for me <laughs> <laughs> my goodness but, absolutely but that is a very big uh change in the law oh yeah it's huge I mean, and that it's something takes that many, many gray area right well um it's something that many states are looking at in terms of legislation you know oregon the Right to Die um, you know, Act has been around for a long, long, long time. Um, so yes, so th- these are, you know, sort of conversations that are starting to happen. And, I, you know, to me, I, again, you know, I, I would not, I, I'm focused on making sure that people have options that are in line with, you know, what they want. And um, if, and if that brings about this kind of conversation about, you know, palliative care, about hospice, about mortality, that's fantastic. Um, I'm all about um, about having these conversations, as you know. And tell me why you've taken um, you know such a stance as to you know cre- create online dialogue, to create um, this conference or event that you created last year, and uh, to write the way you do. And uh, you're really starting a movement to to challenge uh, the, the medical profession, and I guess all of us to think about this topic and. And, uh, and and to make potentially very different choices than than get made today. Well, I definitely would not say I'm starting a movement. I think I'm part of a movement that's been around for a long time. So I don't I don't take credit for that. I think, like you said, I'm I'm leveraging newer ways of connecting with maybe younger people about this topic of of ways that you know people are consuming. Um, digital media, you know, 24 seven now. So the ways that we think about reaching people with this kind of conversation, I think need to be re reinvented, rethought. And so that's what I've been most focused on. I think, you know, I, I, you know, really think that um, based on the experience that I've had as a physician, um, I I feel this need, I'm compelled um, to, to make change. And I think the change is actually going to start with a, a culture shift that's already starting to happen, that 
again, people are allowing this conversation about mortality into the consciousness. You know, books like Being Mortal, Atul Gawande's book has been on the bestseller list for years. Um, When Breath Becomes Air, uh, Dr. Paul Kalanithi wrote the memoir while he was dying of cancer at 37. I mean, that, that, that was also a bestseller, I think, for something like 70 weeks. Um, people are wanting to think about this, talk about I am trying to, you know, maintain that momentum to push this movement forward um, because I think that um, it's something that's critically important. Um, you know, it's as human beings, um, recognizing our mortality makes, you know, living life that much better. Um, like you said, knowing one day that will, that it will end. Yeah. Um, and I guess we have to deal with this now as a society. I, um, I forget the numbers. I've heard you talk about them. Um, as more and more baby boomers hit 65 and beyond, Mm -hmm. Um, am I remembering this right, that the, we're going to have the largest number of people dying in the United States from natural causes? What, what, what's this stat I've heard you talk about? Do you know what I'm, say, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. 10,000 baby boomers turning six, turn 65 every day in this country. So we are, you know, very soon going to be hitting this wave um, of, of people requiring more care, um, because as people age, we know they accumulate, you know, uh, chronic medical problems and then facing the end of life. And we're so incredibly ill-equipped, um, to handle, you know, what will be, uh, of course, a financial and emotional and, and a really maybe even spiritual kind of burden in this country. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work that I do is geared around, you know, how can we come together, um, in an interdisciplinary way, knowing that doctors don't have all the answers, knowing that policymakers don't have all the answers um, to create the new products, the new services and systems that it's going to take to care for these people. I, I think it's our civic responsibility to be to be thinking about this, to be coming up with solutions together, um, which is you know one of the reasons I founded Endwell as a as a place, as a symposium where people can come together to talk about this, to create, you know, new networks, um, to make big change. Well, it's incredibly inspiring. Um, I love that you're having this conversation. I think it's, I think it's fascinating that you as a, uh, could I say younger physician would get focused on this. You're not necessarily, uh, the type of doc that one might, certainly I might think of would be on the forefront of having this dialogue. Uh, is there anything else, doctor, you want to touch on before we wrap? Oh, geez. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, (laughs) No, I don't think so. Well, I can't thank you enough. Uh, You're an extraordinary human being. Uh, It's been a pleasure getting to know you and uh, hoping to welcome you and your husband down to Santa Cruz for dinner sometime soon. Um, Oh, we'd love it. It'd be great to have you guys um, and spend a little bit more time together. And uh, I know how deeply Carrie uh, enjoyed you know, the opportunity to work with you. And um, so thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Carrie is amazing. I got to be, I had coffee the other day and I just, she is such a powerhouse and, and really with the March for our lives event, like made it happen. It was just amazing. So I just felt really lucky to, to meet her kind of randomly on Facebook and then, you know, get to get to work so closely with her. It was, it was awesome. Well, the two of you together were, uh, one mega tour de force that's for sure i'll I'll never forget that day watching you guys divide and conquer and it it i think most people had they seen you two together would never in a thousand years believe that you hadn't been working together for decades i mean Uh. it was incredible um so thank you we love you and uh, love to get to know your husband and love to have you down to santa cruz for dinner soon yeah let's do it this summer I, i would love that It sure is beautiful by the ocean in the summertime. (laughs) All right. All right. Let's make it happen. Thank you so much, doctor. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay. Whew. What a conversation. And uh, just as a side note to let you know that there are only seven states in the United States currently that have a right to die law. The first was Oregon. Uh, passed over 20 years ago, and today, California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington are the parts of the United States 
where your doctor is actually allowed to uh, help you um, stick the landing. Now, is there someone in your life who would love this episode? It's an incredibly important topic. Why not share it with them right now? We would love it if you shared this episode uh, with Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter on uh, social media right now. Your shares, your reviews um, really make a huge difference to legends and losers, uh, and we all appreciate it. I deeply appreciate it. Now, is it time for you to schedule your free uh, business growth review with NetSuite? Go to netsuite.com slash legends and get yourself set up for a one-hour uh, growth review with an expert in your industry who will help you figure out how to turbocharge your growth. Now, the folks at Investopedia say that uh, money management and fatigue are two of the biggest challenges facing growing businesses. And I don't know about you, but money management can often lead to fatigue for me. Uh, NetSuite is purpose-built to help you run every aspect of your business and address uh, this giant management headache. From orders to customers to cash flow to finances uh, to inventory and more, uh, stay on top of tax laws, all of it. NetSuite is a complete system for running your business in the cloud and, frankly, from your phone. NetSuite has a bunch of dashboards. You can, you can be out in the world and be on top of your business at the same time. Uh, so why not uh, check out NetSuite? Set up your free growth review today at netsuite.com slash legends. All right. We would like to thank the amazing documentary Endgame. Uh, co-produced by our guest today. Uh, check it out on Netflix. That's Endgame. Uh, Equity Directory. If you're uh, in the startup world, then you need to get on equitydirectory.com. This is the community where people come together and startups can uh, look for talent uh, who's will, who are willing to work for primarily equity. It's a great idea and a great resource. Check out equitydirectory.com. The amazing people at onelifefullylive.org. Yeah, while we're alive, why not dream, plan, and live our best possible life? That's what One Life is all about. As a nonprofit, we try to deliver content and conferences and events around these topics as close to free as possible to help you get the most out of life. Check out onelifefullylived.org. Now, are you in sales? Uh, do you like to make money? Whether you're in sales management or you're a bag-carrying sales rep, uh, you need to check out the future of sales at Spiro, S-P-I-R-O dot A-I. Download it today. Um, Outposition.com, legendary marketing, PR, and category design in beautiful Singapore. Uh, Legends and Losers, uh, our audience is growing in Asia, um, which is exciting and, and uh, makes me scratch my head a little bit. But uh, hey, there it is. <laughs> So uh, love you, Asia. Love you, Singapore. Been there many times. And check out out-position.com to uh, turbocharge your business in Singapore. Are you a thought leader? Do you need to get your leading thoughts on some podcasts? Check out interviewvalet.com. You be the guest and they do the rest. If you want to grow yourself, grow your business, check out the new place for entrepreneurs on the internet, growwire.com. I'm uh, proud to be proud, proud to be a contributor, um, and I'm blogging on a regular basis. Check it out, growwire.com. Now, are you working long hours? Are you feeling a little whelmed? That is to say, overly whelmed? <laughs> is there such thing as underwhelmed? I guess there is underwhelmed. There's overwhelmed. And maybe there's just whelm. But regardless of where you are on the spectrum, check out Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. Uh, a virtual uh, assistant can make a giant difference in your life. And uh, they're more cost effective than you might realize. So check out Bottleneck dot online today and the california pacific medical center check out sutterhealth.org slash c p m c all right i need to remind you that this oddcast is a sole property of the legends and losers oddcast network and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it all rights do remain disturbed this oddcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts however it is never tested on gmos uh and you must be forewarned that we may look we may make some forward-looking statements uh, present moment looking statements uh backward looking statements and completely preposterous preposterous <laughs> preposterous statements listen to johnny cash support your local healthcare professional don't be lame get out of the passing lane only buy free range pasture raised eggs i love you dandy candy thank you mom and dad or maybe the other way around and hey colin uh this oddcast really ties the room together doesn't it 
Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, CEO of GoodEgg.com. Sorry, Marky, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us on this uh, super special episode of Legends and Losers, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.